Well, good evening, everyone. Glad to see everyone here. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Eric Van Lanker. I'm Iowa Lieutenant Governor candidate running with our next governor of the state of Iowa, Deidre DeGere, and uh, really happy to be her partner, and especially happy to be here to, to talk about something that's important to all Iowans uh, is uh, education. So uh, thanks for being here, and um, we'll get started. I think everyone's in here. Uh, other folks can join in here, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started with uh, our discussion tonight on um, Deidre Desier's plan uh, for education for a limitless future. Our education policy, it was uh, released in the last 24 hours, and uh, we're very excited about it. I think everyone's excited about it um, because our goal is to make sure that Iowa's public schools are number one in the nation. So with me tonight, I'm happy to have my life partner, uh, my wife, Tanya, and she just entered her 31st year of teaching uh, this week with kids showing up to school and, and happy first week of school to everyone. I know we have a lot of educators joining us uh, tonight, so hope you're all off to a great start uh, to your school year. And um, so how has your school year started, Tanya? Well, it's actually started pretty good. Um, I teach first grade. Uh, there are three first grades in my building, and uh, I have a fabulous team that I work with. Our kids are settling into the routine, and we're building those relationships and uh, getting back in the routine of school. Mm -hmm. Are it's the good. kids always excited for that first week, probably seeing each other again? And Oh, that, yeah, uh, definitely. Definitely. They like to see each other, see their friends out on the playground at lunch, in the hallway, any chance they get. Great, great. So uh, I mentioned that you're starting your 31st year in teaching. Um, tell us a little bit more about uh, your background in teaching. Share that with our friends here. Well, I went to college at what my husband likes to call the greatest place on the on the planet, and which is the University of Northern Iowa. And I'm graduated, high. yeah, <laughs> graduated from UNI with a degree in K six elementary ed, K twelve what we used to call moderate, severe, profound education. I started my, I got my first job, uh, the job I dreamed of in, um, well, severe and profound, what we now, yeah, what we call significant disabilities now. And I taught that for 20 years here in Clinton. And 11 years ago, I made the switch to gen ed and I'm teaching first grade now. I also have a master's from Morningside and um, a lot of other hours under my belt. Great. So, um, so it's been really great, uh, obviously, for my background, too, to just have that, uh, you know, kitchen table experience talking to my wife about uh, her educational experiences. And um, Tanya's brother has also been in uh, the education business. And I think he's on tonight. Hi, Wes. Uh, how, how long has Wes been in this? Business. He's been, I've been, at, I, I just celebrated or completed my 30 years and Wes just completed his 25 years with our district. So yeah, okay. he taught physics at the high school level yep. and other science classes. And, and he's an administrator now too. So mm -hmm. uh, around the family holiday tables or just any dinner table, there's a lot of discussion about education and, and public schools and the importance of that. And so um, let's, uh, I'm going to hit a, a few of uh, the highlights of, um, of the education policy that uh, Deidre released uh, this week. And so just kind of break it down in a couple of sections. So I want to talk, first of all, I want to hit some three points um, of what uh, Deidre's policy will do for students. Uh, first of all, we're going to fully fund the education system. And we're talking about funding the education system at a level that keeps up with the inflationary rates. And we're even talking about just making sure it's funded at, at, the, at a minimum of 4% uh, supplemental state aid every single year so that our school districts have an opportunity to meet increased operational expenses. Because as we all know, no matter what we do, whatever business we're in, uh, expenses, you really see those go down from year to year. So that's important for our public schools. We're going to expand access to early childhood education. And also for our students, we're gonna reinvest in trade programs. 
So for educators, what we're going to do is increase compensation to public school educators, administrators, and our support professionals. We're also going to restore and enhance collective bargaining. Uh, so those folks uh, are, are able to represent themselves and uh, hopefully that'll encourage other teachers to come back into the business now that they know they have a voice in it. Uh, also, uh, we're going to reinstate a loan forgiveness program for educators who want to come work in our public school system. Uh, we know uh, how burdensome some student loans can be on folks, and so we'd like to help them um, uh, with that challenge. Um, so those are just a uh, quick three highlights uh, in each area for students and for educators. Um, Tanya, let me go to you real quick and ask you about um, the expanded access to early childhood education. What, what's the importance of that? Well, I think any opportunity we can get children, students into classrooms is only beneficial to them. It, may, it will help them be prepared to come to kindergarten, to get into first grade. It also allows us the opportunity to evaluate their needs and if they need to take a different route in the education, in the in their education, gives us that opportunity to get things started because the sooner we can identify and support those needs, the sooner we have, you know, the opportunity they have to maybe get back on the right track of gen ed. Yeah. And then under educators, you know, uh, we're very concerned with what's happened, especially since chapter 20 was gutted, taking away really a lot of negotiating rights from our teachers. Um, you know, at that time, we saw a lot of teachers uh, start leaving Iowa uh, for, for surrounding states. Uh, in the meantime, we've also seen the amount of, um, of teachers who were going to our state universities uh, for education, that number started to decline uh, even before that, but even worse after that. So um, why is this important, uh, Tanya? I know we've been talking a lot uh, where you and I travel. We've been talking a lot recently about vacancies and positions in our school districts. What are you hearing on, on that front? Well, just in our school district and Clinton Community School District, we have roughly 18 teaching positions still considered open. And that's from, you know, preschool to the high school. Um, that means those classes for right now are not being offered. We don't have a way to cover them which could affect, I, I suppose, maybe some graduation opportunities or being able to go on to um, the other school or having to find a way to fill those holes in your, in your education. Um, we also have 18 para, uh, roughly 18 para support positions that are open. And that means we've got students that aren't getting the support that they need. And that doesn't include the, the regular day-to-day -day stuff where we have illness or family emergencies or pregnancies. Um, bus drivers, that's huge right now. And in our district, we've been encouraged the, to get our CDLs um, and drive students, uh, drive buses to and from school. Um, and, that's, and there have been some paras that have taken advantage of that, a couple of teachers. Coaches are taking, care, are taking advantage of that. And the CDLs would be at the district's expense. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting time. I have some friends that uh, teach out in rural districts and they have uh, in this district uh, a principal that is covering a class and along with three other teachers. So they're trying to divide and conquer so that their students are getting what they need. Yeah, and I mean, all of this relates then to the fact that we just wanna provide quality education mm -hmm. uh, to all of our students, no matter where your school is, whether it's in a city or rural community. You know, these schools are important to our rural communities. They're the center of our communities. They're the gem of our community. It's the pride and joy uh, of all these communities. And when we talk about uh, encouraging family farms and generation and farms to stay in generations and folks that want to stay uh, where they were born and raised is an uh, important aspect of really a, very much a foundation 
of that concept is that they have a good quality school nearby. And, um, and we know what a quality education can do for Iowans. You know, a lot of you have maybe heard me talk about this, but you know, I'm a, I'm a public school kid myself from kindergarten through college. Tanya is too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and our kids are too, they were public school kids. But the difference between when Tanya and I graduated from public schools, high schools, compared to when our kids graduated is that we were number one in the nation uh, when we graduated high school. And uh, our kids, they don't have that same benefit now. And what was that benefit? Well, that benefit was people knew about Iowa's public schools. They knew, you know, we knew whenever we applied for that first job or that first internship or onto the next educational experience that if we had that high school uh, diploma from a public school, that that meant something, that meant bonus points for us. We have a college roommate from Dubuque County who always tells the story about how he applied for a job in Chicago. And the first thing that they mentioned they, when they were looking over his resume is they, they said, wow, you got a, an Iowa public school education. Um, that's how important it was. But our kids don't have that uh, luxury right now because Iowa's slipping the, from the first down to the middle of the pack now and uh, with no signs of that turning around. Unless we take control of this and we turn around ourselves. And that's what the Education for Limitless Future introduced by Deidre Dugier will do uh, for our students around the state. So if folks have questions, um, please post those up there and they'll get to us and we'll, we'll be more than happy to, to work on those uh, with you if you want more details on what our education for limitless future includes, uh, we can certainly get into that too. Uh, I know there was a question about uh, labor availability uh, being a challenge in, in our mm -hmm. rural areas and uh, you know what Iowa can do K through 12 um, to help that, to address that. And I think, um, you know, I think part of our plan that, ad that addresses, you know, bringing the trades programs back into schools to help prepare uh, students for careers of the future will be a, a, a big deal in that area. Um, you know, and those trades include electrical work, cosmetology, carpentry, but they can include so much more too. And that's where we partner with our community, uh, with our locally elected school boards and say, what programs do we need here? Uh, families want to stay in these rural areas. What can we do to support those? What do the industries need uh, for um, uh, the educated, well-trained uh, employee pool? What, what do they need? We hear that here in Clinton all the time when we work with our economic development folks is that they need folks that are leaving high school that have the training that they need to plug those folks right into their position. So we'll work with them uh, to find out what those aspects are and how we can include those in our local schools and even partnering with our community colleges, you know, which is another part of our uh, public education system that's very important. Uh, our son is a graduate of Kirkwood Community College in Cedar Rapids, uh, and he's now taken that degree to be, uh, he's in his just over a uh, year as being a paramedic in Cedar Rapids. Um, so, so those positions are, those considerations are uh, very important because we do want to make sure our rural communities are still viable. And again, as I mentioned earlier, keeping public schools healthy, uh, making that the foundation of those communities. And if we need to uh, partner and provide more programs that make sense for that community, then uh, we should be all ears to make that happen. You know, something, Eric, that we've noticed and we've chatted a lot about is when we go to parades and we go to some of those smaller communities, the uh, the people that the viewers of the parade are wearing their high school T-shirts and they're really excited. You can tell that they're wearing the colors and they're spending their time there on Friday and Saturdays uh, cheering on their teams. And, you know, when we go down those those streets, they are cheering. They want public education. They want their schools to stay in their communities. Yeah, that's right. I mean, for sure, it's, it's again, the center of the community. And yep, we've seen that in action so many times. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's beyond, uh, I'm surprised, you, 
you surprised me a little bit there about cheering on the teams and stuff, uh, being a, a band booster president. You, yeah. you didn't mention and also, you know, cheering on the band and cheering on the band. Yep. Going to yep. the, going to the Go plays. Band. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Go band. Hey, did you, when you were going through the points of the new policy, did you talk about mental health at all? Did you hit that bullet? Um, I did not. So uh, thanks for bringing that up because. Uh, part of the support for all these things is that Deidre's Education for a Limitless Future also includes that we want to ensure that we have uh, medical health counselors. Uh, mental or social, health. What's that? Mental health. Oh, thank you. Mental health uh, counselors or social workers in, in every school, you know, to address mental health needs, not just of students, but also uh, for our staff as well. Uh, so I, I can imagine how important that is. Um, you, you know how important that is when, when you have uh, kids that you, that need that extra help. Yeah, um, kids uh, feel like kids are coming in with more and more baggage and um, issues that they need help dealing with and processing. And in our school district, we're lucky enough to have partnered with Life Connections. And we do have mental health counselors in our buildings uh, pretty much full time. I know in my building, um, our our therapist is there. She's there a lot. And you go to her and it's already, you know, coming up on September and she's booked for the year. Um, and, I, and I do teach in a larger elementary school, but the need is there and it's nice to be able to take care of it right there at school. And then parents aren't, parents don't have to take time to come and get their kids, take them out of school, get them to their appointment and get them back. So it really has been a beneficial program. It's just still not enough. Yeah, I mean, to to hear you say you do have someone like that in your building, and that's just still not enough for all of your students. I mean, but uh, this is a good start to make sure that we have that in our schools, uh, we believe. So um, we had a, another question here uh, with the funding for preschool uh, count a child as a whole. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, we could certainly look into that and, and see what we could do um, in that area. Um, and then would there be support for transportation funding? I definitely think that would have to be part of the plan, um, especially as schools have already consolidated. Tanya and I were at an event um, a few weeks ago, a farmer's union event, where we talked to some folks there and they have a consolidated school district that is so uh, big now that some kids do spend uh, an hour on or the bus, more. an hour or more on the bus to get to school and then also get back to school. So we know how important that is uh, for that transportation so that they have that ability to get the, to school, obviously. So yes, we would, uh, we would include that in there as well. Again, if anyone has any questions, please uh, go ahead and uh, type those in and, and they'll get to us here as soon as possible. Um, I did just hit on some bullet points earlier about Deidre's plan for education for a limitless future, um, but you can find this whole uh, policy at uh, www.dejearforiowa.com. Uh, you'll see you'll see, see this plan fettered out even more um, because uh, we really want uh, folks to know that this this plans we talked a lot about community and that's what this plan is about. It's going to help teachers, uh, faculty, staff. Uh, you know, we talked about our bus drivers, cooks, the whole support staff, paras. But it'll benefit the students, it'll benefit the families, it'll benefit communities. And we're gonna we're gonna jumpstart this thing. And Deidre's policy is that we're gonna have an immediate when when Deidre Desir becomes governor, we're gonna have an immediate infusion of three hundred million dollars from the budget surplus, just to reset the underfunding of the last four years of our education system. And and, and that that underfunding is what we're talking about. Is uh, the state legislature and our current governor have only uh, funded our schools at a, a growth rate. The supplemental state aid is what we call it, but it's the growth rate of how much more money they're going to get each year in state aid. Uh, and, and that's been funded at just around an average of 2%. And if you look at it over 10 years, it's been 
quite frankly, under 2%. We all know that the inflationary rates uh, that we've all been seeing here in the state of Iowa are anywhere from 4 to 8% uh, during the last several years. There's my cat, everyone. <laughs> Graylin. Graylin is also a big supporter of our public yes. school system. He knows how important it is. <laughs> um, so uh, we like to, uh, so that's what we're talking about, is making sure that we're funding schools at the rate of inflation so that they can pay for increased costs. And that's why Dieter's plan also includes that we would use a minimum of 4% supplemental state aid every year to start the year and then also address whatever that inflationary rate may be uh, from there so that we're appropriately funding our schools. Um, and uh, another point in here I'd like to hit on because I, I know it's big in our rural communities, especially, well, shoot, I mean, it's, it's actually also big in, in uh, our larger communities, but I know we just talked with, uh, with a, a new friend of ours that uh, recently just had to close her uh, child care uh, and, and what, a, what a blow that is to her community. So uh, we also want to make sure that we invest in, uh, in, in quality, affordable child care uh, statewide, but again, especially in our rural and our lower income communities, because uh, we know what that, uh, what a stress that can be uh, on our families as well. Um, I certainly remember when our now adult children uh, were having to have child care and, and what a stress that is on the family budget and, and how you do that. I mean, uh, I, I remember, uh, we used to remember we had a conversation at one time about uh, pretty much my paycheck was going to our youngest, to Caitlin's uh, child care. At one time, we thought about uh, just, I would stay home with her uh, during the day and I get an evening part-time job or something. Uh, so those are difficult uh, decisions, but uh, so we know how important those things are too. Uh, anyone have any questions for us or anything about uh, Deidre's education for a limitless future plan? Go ahead and type those in there. Um, uh, folks are asking about, uh, so we have a question uh, about uh, recently, uh, earlier this week, uh, the Spirit Lake School um, had approved a policy to allow some staff uh, to carry firearms. This is in response to school shootings. Um, you know, that's uh, not something uh, that we really support. Um, I know I know that Tanya has heard this many times from people, well, we should just, uh, we should just have, you, you know, you, Tanya, teacher, <laughs> uh, carry, carry a weapon. No, uh, no you, know, I, you know, I've had very passionate, very, yeah, yeah, big discussions about this. And absolutely, my job is just to protect the students in my room. It's not to go after the shooter or the, the intruder or whatever. Uh, we use the run, hide, fight. Uh, and that, yeah, that's my job. Not, uh, yeah, to go take care of that. Um, Plus, just having a gun in my classroom just makes me so nervous, even if it's in a safe. Well, if you've ever seen my desk, it would be under a pile that I would have to find. And yeah, and then remember the combination. And yeah. yeah, so no, my job is to take care of the kiddos and get them get them to a place that's safe. And a gun in the, for me, a gun in the classroom is not the answer. An armed guard at the door is not the answer. Uh, yeah, I, and even talking about an armed guard, if you're going to provide staff uh, with these firearms, is obviously training uh, that's a, that should be involved, I would hope, uh, as the school's liability insurance carrier, I'm sure, uh, would be very interested in what sort of program that would entail uh, when you're arming uh, staff. We'd rather see, uh, we'd rather see uh, our public funds, you know, go to uh, as we addressed uh, mental health, health support in our schools, mm -hmm. uh, we think would be more preventative and go a, lot, a much further way yes. uh, in, into serving, uh, again, our students and our teachers who are, who are in the schools. So I think uh, 
to us, that's a better plan. Uh, and it's a more uh, stable plan, I believe, and, and quite frankly, a safer plan. Um, look, Tanya and I both have our concealed carry. We went through the classes, um, but you know, and, and just for everyone's information, Tanya is an amazingly good shot. Uh, but in those instances, it's different uh, when you're in those instances as opposed to when you're on mm -hmm. a firing range. Uh, so uh, that's, and I know that's why Tanya's not interested in, in carrying in those instances because you never know. So um, good question though. Thank you. If anyone else has any more questions, we'd love to, um, love to uh, address those. Um, you know, we're at a time now where we need to get public education back to number one. And uh, we know, you know, you hate to say that money is always the issue, but money here is the issue. We need to reinvest in our public schools, in our children's future. It's very important. We don't believe that siphoning money off uh, for a voucher program for just a handful of students uh, to go to private schools is the answer. You know, we know that Governor Kim Reynolds would love nothing more than to have a, a voucher plan that would take $54 million of public funds away from our public schools and put them in private schools to help only 10,000 students in very few counties where they have private schools. I think we, I think there's private schools in only 88 of our 99 counties. Deidre Desir and I would like to take that $54 million and put it back into our public schools where it will help 484,000 public school kids in all 99 of our counties. That's, that's where our priority is right now. We want to get Iowa's public education system back to number one in, uh, in the nation again. Um, please type in your questions if you have any uh, qu any further questions about this. I just want to remind you again, uh, you can find this full policy, Dieter Desjere's Education for a Limitless Future policy. You can find that at DesjereForIowa.com. Um, they'll have all the details on there uh, about, uh, about Dieter's plan and how we're going to get uh, Iowa back to being number one in the nation for public school systems. And we'll just do a quick last call for any more questions that anyone may have. Um, I understand there's quite a few of our friends on here who are uh, in agreement of the no voucher uh, system. So uh, it's, you know, it's, it's important that on that issue uh, that really that you, you, you know, Obviously, elect Deidre Desjere as your next governor. She'll be ready to veto that plan if that plan comes across uh, her desk. You know, our current governor, Kim Reynolds, is, is very committed to getting this plan passed. In fact, so much so that uh, she went out and, and found primary opponents to her own Republican legislators who would support the voucher plan and took them out in the primary so that she can get this voucher plan passed. So uh, what I'm saying is not only is electing Deidre Desjere as governor who could veto that plan, but even I, you know, consider the rest of your ballot where, for your state senators and your state representatives uh, when you're voting in November. I think um, just having taught in public school for 31 years, it's, di or in my 31st year, it's a different world out there right now. I was, and I still am proud to be a teacher and I get excited when I get a new group of, of first graders that come into my room and that I get, I have the opportunity, I get to teach them how to read. And when that light bulb goes off, it's amazing. But over the last couple of years, we are being demonized that I'm reading in first grade inappropriate books, that I am, uh, oh, I'm teaching them things that I have no business teaching them, which is absolutely not true. Um, so we really need this. Deidre is so passionate about public education. It's, it's, it's fun to talk to her about it. It, it gets you 
riled up and we can do this and our kids, our children deserve this. They deserve the very best education. And when they have that education, they're going to go out and they're going to want to stay in Iowa and they're going to want to work in Iowa and they're going to want to raise their families in Iowa. And so we need Deidre, we need Eric in that at the Capitol to help us you know, see this through. It, it is so important. What you just talked about is what how we were raised in the public school experiences that we had and why we continue to live in Iowa mm -hmm. was because of those experiences. And, 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 and you talked about, we need this for our students, but we also need this for Tanya and, the, and her uh, teacher friends all across the state, administrators, paras, our bus drivers. We need this for all of them too. Because if, if you're from Iowa, and, and I, I'm sure maybe this is probably true in other states, but I guarantee you, if you're from Iowa and you went through the Iowa public school system, any years in your life, whatever generation you went through, I would almost bet that any of you could tell a story about how a teacher influenced you or got you back on the right track to, mm -hmm. to where you are today. I, everyone's got that story. Everyone's got that teacher connection. If it's not one teacher, it's two. It's maybe it's a coach or a principal. Maybe it's that custodian that spent the extra time with you while you waited for your parents in the hallway, because that's what our public schools are here in Iowa. We nurture our children, we come together there. And so we need to support our educators and our, all of our support staff and administrators in our school district as well. Yeah. Who influenced you? What's your teacher? Uh, third grade was Mrs. Zimmerman because she, I just loved how she read books to us. And then, um, I had the opportunity in, um, when I was in high school to volunteer in a severe and profound classroom. And that cinched it for me. I fell in love and Margie Bankston was my hero, my mentor, and it led me down that special ed path and forever grateful to Margie for that opportunity and loved the 20 years that I spent. And uh, lucky for me, we have the level three students in my building or the, the students who are level three in my building. So I still get to feed that need and uh, have lots of fun and great friends and in my building, so yeah. Well, very cool. That's that's what I mean. We all have these stories, right? I mean, um, I have, gosh, I don't, I don't know. I had uh, uh, Mr. Brazi in sixth or seventh grade. You know how I am. I can't remember. You can't remember my me. grades or my teachers. <laughs> I do remember a lot of them, but you know those those sorts of folks that that stick out that challenged uh, uh, challenged a, a real fire in me that I didn't know t t for math. You know, that's what he did. I love, I love math. And then when I got to high school, uh, it was, uh, uh, Mr. Deerling, uh, Terry, he always insisted that we call him Terry Deerling, but he was our speech teacher. And, uh, he, uh, spent a lot of time with us and, and, uh, you know, the, the way he had his interactions with us and treated us as, as really is kind of equals, but also a mentor, uh, mm -hmm. was really important. So, um, and, and we, so I was just speaking about uh, my speech teacher, who also, by the way, got me into drama <laughs> as well. <laughs> and then, right, and then, then these things, when these teachers challenge you, um, you find things you didn't know you were capable of. Right? No, absolutely. And that's it. I mean, I, I have to say, I, my high school years, I certainly was not the most outgoing person. But when I had those challenges and I uh, had that support from that teacher, um, I mean, gosh, that's... Uh, that's why I did those things in high school. And that's really why I'm uh, doing the things that I uh, do today and enjoy today. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, uh, as we talked about, so I just talked about a drama coach and you and I talked about band here a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. The question that just came in is, will art programs be funded? And that absolutely it'll be funded. When we talk about funding schools, we're talking about funding all of the programs. Absolutely. How many times have you and I had to go and fight 
to keep banned in our buildings and available to our students. Yes. Um, been, I've been very vocal and a lot of other teachers too for several years. Um, elementary students only got art for 40 minutes every other week. And that was, uh, that was just awful for those kids who look forward to that time, 40 minutes of just time to be creative. And luckily for us, we've been able to get back to art once a week for 40 minutes. But imagine what, uh, what else we could do and provide for our students. Absolutely. I mean, I think we've all heard and seen the studies about how uh, learning music, learning an instrument uh, can really spark a child's brain, a student's brain, and, and help them learn more in all subjects and how important that is. And um, I, again, those, those are the times that kids remember too. It's, it's how they learn to socialize and, and get along with each other and support each other. Uh, so those are important mm -hmm. lessons that they learn in those programs as well. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, uh, sorry, we had a question. I'm just trying to catch up to it here. Um, we did have a question about um, our uh, teaching uh, in Iowa, and it's a question about uh, student loan forgiveness program, and that is included here in Deidre's plan for an education for a limitless future. It's included uh, that we will certainly reinstate the loan for, uh, student loan forgiveness uh, programs for uh, uh, teachers that teach in our public schools uh, for a commitment of five years. Uh, we believe that's important uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's important so that we make sure that we're uh, putting quality teachers in our schools. Uh, that that's a really important aspect to us because we can we can put people in those positions, but if they're not uh, qualified, certified, educated uh, educators uh, for our public schools, we won't get back to that number one in the nation that we're looking for. Um, also. Um, the, the thing about the student loans is that, you know, student loan burden can be such a heavy thing. We know this. We've talked about a lot in Clinton County because we have our own um, uh, student loan forgiveness program in Clinton County that I helped start. Um, but what we know from that is that um, the student loan will uh, really dictate to someone like what job they will take, where, where they will work, when they will start a family. Uh, that sort of thing. And I believe with a, if, if we have that student loan forgiveness program, that will uh, help uh, a teacher decide where they want to teach. You know, not every teacher uh, wants to go teach in Cedar Rapids or Des Moines. They maybe want to teach in that rural school, like what they grew up in. And that we want that to happen too, because we need quality teachers all around the state. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, that's a big part of, of uh, Deidre's plan for sure as a student loan forgiveness program. And, and the teacher pay, it, it, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna stack onto that here, uh, is the teacher pay issue too. We need to make sure again, so that we have quality uh, teachers in all of our schools that we address as teacher pay. And especially, we know we've heard it, and Tanya's heard, I've heard it for years, but especially our starting teacher pay, mm -hmm. right? Um, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, because again, those are those are the those tough, difficult years getting started. And so we want to make sure that we're providing them help on that foundation that they can be successful uh, by giving them, uh, you know, a decent wage and then uh, working on their student loan forgiveness along with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, how many you, you've taught for? Well, you just started your thirtieth year. So out of your thirty years, Tanya, uh, how many? How many years did you have a part-time job? Oh, uh, a lot. <laughs> a I'm lot sure. of those years. Yes. Yeah. A lot yeah. of those years. Yeah. And and we know, and I mean, you're not the only one. You know, oh, no. Oh, you, no. You know, you work with teachers now um, that are hoping or working to send their family, their, their kids to college. And now they're yeah. taking a second and job. And they're taking that on. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, second job. and then you can't give your your all to that teaching job, you know, when you're working that second job. But we have we do what we have to do to for our families. 
yeah, and, and we do, we do. And, and sometimes that takes that on. And I know in other professions, uh, they need to do that too. But um, we, we need, again, we need our, our staff at our schools focusing on that job mm -hmm. uh, for our students. That's the investment that we wanna put back into Iowa. Right, not cameras in the classroom. <laughs> no, just I, don't. I, I think we would have a, a much better return on investment by putting paras in our classroom <laughs> than cameras in our classroom. Yes, the appropriate support for our students. Yes, absolutely. But folks, if anyone else has any questions, please uh, uh, put those questions in there. I uh, appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. Uh, really means a lot to us. Uh, this is our number one focus, education. Mm -hmm. We have, you, you can go, you know, to digierforiowa.com and you can see all of the issues that are important to us and, and why Deidre's running for governor and there's all those policies and issues. They're, they're all on there. There's, there's much more than education. But we really feel that uh, getting our public education back to number one in the nation is a great foundation for really almost everything else that we want to do uh, for a better Iowa. Mm -hmm. So unless anyone else has any more questions, um, I wanna say that um, I'm glad that uh, I had this time with my wife. I'm in Des Moines for a conference. <laughs> so she's home. I didn't get to be home for the first week of school um, to, to celebrate that. So we're doing it this That's way. That's okay. I get to go to bed when I want. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> no. And you probably need the rest of the first week of school, just yes. like I imagine all teachers do. Yeah. I don't think I said for anyone who has ever worked in elementary ed this year, I have a class with 14 boys and four girls. So I, I feel like I'm kind of working with the football team and trying to come up with ways to keep these guys busy. So it's going to be a fun year. And yeah, I've had to have a little extra sleep this week. So. All right. That's good. All right. Well, very good. Um, Tanya, thanks for all you do. Thanks for your support of me. And <laughs> Thank you to all the teachers and administrators who are out there. Thank you for what you do. Look, we want to support you. We want this to be better for you and for our students in the, in the, in the state of Iowa. Uh, and we're so excited to, to do this and bring this policy to you. So again, you can check out all the details at DeGereForIowa.com. Thanks, you've everyone. Got to help us. You've got to help us spread the word, though. We, yep. You've got to vote. You've got to talk to your friends, your teacher friends, your family friends. To make this happen, it's going to take all of us. And you've got to vote. This is one of those. We cannot sleep on it. You've got to vote. Yep. And those policy details are there that you can share with your friends. You can email them, text them, send them the link. Um, print it off, put it in your pocket for talking points whenever you're out to dinner with friends or family. So it's it's that important to us. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. We really enjoyed our time uh, speaking with you about Deidre's education for a limitless future. And um, for all you educators out there, have a fantastic school year and uh, thank you. <laughs>